Now that we got the semi-auto discussion mostly out of the way, let's uh, talk about bolt-action design. Now again, it's going to be impossible for me to cover all your different options out there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically break this up into features that are offered in bolt-action so that you can, uh, to help you select for what will meet your long-range mission criteria the best. I'm not going to have a, enough time to go over individual rifles very much. I'll give you some of my uh, best picks, you know, generally speaking, on some of these uh, rifles that would be good in different price ranges and different application ranges, but uh, won't be able to cover them all. Uh, what you have with the bolt-action rifle design is in the late 1800s, uh, when the Mauser, the 1898 Mauser came out, that was kind of the granddaddy to most of the other bolt-actions made after that. The 1903 Springfield was kind of a copy of the 98 Mauser and most of our sporting rifles that we have today like the Remingtons and the Winchesters and all the bolt action hunting rifles you have those are going to be basically modeled after that same basic design so because of the overall similarity in all these various bolt actions in the world that we have today we have a lot of liberty when we're choosing a bolt action rifle uh, especially for manufacturers, what the differences are going to be minor. So uh, any bolt action you got laying around the house, uh, assuming that the cartridge is the appropriate choice for your applications, is going to probably work fine. Uh, a lot of guys, when they have the arguments, you know, Remington versus Winchester versus Savage versus Ruger, it's kind of a Chevy Ford versus Dodge kind of argument. The rifle is going to do its job more than fine. It's going to rest on your shoulders to properly adjust that thing to, to make it hit where you want it to go. So this is mostly going to be on you. The optic selection is going to be crucial, as I said before. Uh, but the rifle itself, most modern bolt-action rifles are built very, very well. So let's just briefly cover some of our main categories of different uh, bolt-actions. And I'll just give you a real quick overview of these. Uh, one thing I want to start off with is uh, military bolt actions, unmodified military surplus rifles. You know, these things can actually make really, really great shooters. You can grab an old uh, M91 Mosin agent for like $90 at a pawn shop, and it might even shoot better than a lot of hunting rifles that you could buy for $500. The last, uh, I had an M44 carbine an old Russian one. I got it for like uh, $65, I think, at a gun show. And that thing shot like uh, half-inch groups or three-quarter-inch groups. So it was doing pretty good. Uh, most of your Mausers, your 03 Springfields, your 1917 Enfields, the, the rifle is going to shoot more than fine. It's going to mostly rest on the gunsmith's ability to properly uh, drill and tap it for scope mounts that are square and things like that that's going to help that rifle uh, be uh, perform well for your scoped applications because you're going to put a scope on this thing. But uh, as long as your gunsmith knows what he's doing and he doesn't screw it up too bad, you should have absolutely no problem. Any military design is going to be fine, even if you unmodify. You don't have to sporterize it. You don't have to change triggers. They're going to all shoot just fine. Sporterized military rifles, that's basically the same thing. That's where you take an old military rifle and you uh, kind of put aftermarket parts on it. I generally actually don't do that very much. I think that uh, 
the military designs are actually very well suited for military applications. Uh, so I leave the entire stock together usually, and the um, only thing I would do is get the bolt bent down and uh, mount a scope rail on there, and they usually work really, really well. I don't even rebarrel them. Military barrels are actually very, very uh, good quality most of the time and have a long life expectancy. So uh, most of your military rifles you pick up for very cheap should usually shoot very, very well like a sub minute of angle most of the time in my experience even short model lee infields that have terrible accuracy problems at times if you work the bugs out of them get all the screws tight and make sure your stock bedding is good then things will shoot under a minute all day long so a lot of guys poo poo old military rifles thinking they're cheap junk but actually they're very well built and a lot of them are built way stronger and to even higher uh tolerances uh, and manufacturing, you know, military specifications that are higher than uh, commercial specifications. So those are actually really good choice military rifles. Uh, sporting rifles in the the bolt action design, like I said before, you know, a Remington 700 is probably the most universally uh, used one to build custom rifles on or to have sniper rifles built on. Your uh, U.S. Army M24 sniper weapon system. That thing is basically a Remington 700 action that has been uh, done up into a sniper rifle platform. It's actually a long action that is uh, interchangeable with 300 Winchester Magnum or 308. So they just change barrels and uh, bolts on there, and then you can switch cartridges. Uh, your U U.S. Marine Corps sniper rifle is the M40, which again is basically a Remington M40, which is a model 700 Remington. And uh, so that's kind of the standard Carlos Hathcock in Vietnam used a Winchester Model 70, which is just as good as a Remington 700 for all practical purposes. A lot of guys like to argue back and forth. But again, any of even the Savage rifles, any of that stuff is going to work just fine. So r rifle selection, most of the stuff out there is going to work just fine as far as your actions are concerned. Uh, one thing that you're going to want to watch when you're doing your uh, rifle selection is your barrel design. Uh, most guys really like, for long-range purposes, bull barrels. And uh, we didn't talk about this uh, in uh, our harmonics video where we discussed rifle harmonics and vibrations. But another reason to increase barrel rigidity by having a, a thicker barrel is an issue called heat flex. Uh, what you have happening is often in a rifle barrel, the bore hole is not perfectly centered in the cross-section of the barrel. Uh, this is especially common in lower quality, commercially available barrels that are built just real fast. And uh, what can happen is that during barrel heating between shots, the metal will ex expand slightly in the barrel. And uh, if the borehole is not perfectly centered, uh, the expansion of the, the metal in the barrel due to heating can be disproportional and can warp the barrel slightly from one side to the other. So this can cause a slight shift of zero and can also alter the vibration dynamics of the rifle. If, you're, if your barrel starts warping to one side, it could touch the stock differently down in that channel there. That's why a lot of guys like to free float the rifle because uh, that eliminates the problem of changing harmonic vibrations due to barrel flex. Uh, this heat flex usually occurs in a very, very small amounts and is actually usually unmeasurable. So it's interesting to note that although this heat flex effect is real, it does happen, it's gotten a lot more attention than it perhaps deserves because most of the stuff that's attributed to heat flex is actually should be attributed to barrel harmonics. And so rigidity can fix both those things though. So the fatter your barrel is, the less likely it is to be deflected by things like heat warp or even by harmonic vibrations. So generally speaking, Heavier barrels do seem to usually perform better than skinny ones. Now, another way that this uh, heat warp problem can also be averted is uh, simply by using good quality barrels in which the bores are centered with greater degrees of precision within the cross section. So if you've got, like most of your premium barrels that you buy, they're a little more expensive. They're just... Uh, held to higher uh, manufacturer standards to where the borehole is perfectly centered in your metal. Therefore, when the heating occurs, it's not disproportional. It'll be even. 
And so that can fix the problem right there. There's a lot of long, skinny barrels that are less rigid that do not have any heat warp problems at all. So you can just use a heavier or a better quality barrel if uh, you want to keep your uh, weight light on your rifle, like in a hunting rifle that you want to be able to pack around. Just use a better quality barrel if the one you have on there doesn't shoot good already. And like I said in the video before, you can manipulate the, bar the harmonics of even a, a bad barrel to where it will shoot good anyways just by man manipulating the harmonics and vibrations. So if you haven't seen that, watch that. I highly recommend it. Um, one big advantage and probably the reason why I actually do prefer heavy barrels the most is because of the increased weight, which reduces felt recoil and muzzle jump. And uh, when you're shooting a big magnum, heavy barrels absorb a lot of the recoil. So although skinny barrels can be made to shoot just as well as heavy barrels sometimes, for the sake of recoil reduction due to increased weight, heavy barrels really do have something going for them. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, let's talk briefly about barrel length. This is going to be something that's important to uh, consider uh, when you're doing your rifle selection. Uh, the basic rule of thumb here is to choose the barrel length based on your cartridge choice. Basically, bigger cartridges like Magnum cartridges need to burn a lot more powder in order to achieve their published performance. So in general, cartridges like the 50 BMG and some of the other Super Magnums out there require barrel lengths of close to 30 inches in order to burn all their powder effectively. 30 inches is a pretty long rifle barrel. Uh, other hot magnums and, uh, you know, like cartridges like the 7mm Remington Ultra Magnum or something like a 30 378 Weatherby Magnum, those things are going to need at least 28 inches of barrel length in order to get that uh, ballistic performance out of there. Uh, your more typical magnum calibers like the uh, 300 Win Mag or the 7mm Remington Magnum, the standard magnums, and even the 338 La Pua Magnum, they need about 26 inches uh, to get their level of performance. So again, your barrel length, you know, you're going to want to base that on which cartridge you're shooting and how much you absolutely need. So if you're shooting the standard long action type cartridges, like your 30 odd six, your 270, some of those, uh, 24 inch barrel usually does fine. And some of your more efficient cartridges like the 308 Winchester or the 223 or some of the other ones that we've discussed in their cartridge selection video, uh, they can get away with a pretty short barrel. Some guys even like to use the super stubby 20-inch bull barrels on their 308s, they, uh, as they're more stiff because you know they're shorter in proportion to their diameter, so they're a lot more stout. So when you're choosing your barrel length, make sure that you match it to your cartridge. And usually if you buy a production rifle, they're going to have the barrel length already you know, appropriate for the cartridge that is chambered for. So uh, you don't want to go too long. That's one thing to consider. Uh, I'd rather go too short than too long as increasing length with, without increasing diameter makes for a less rigid barrel. And that can wreak havoc with your harmonics. Short fat barrels, as I said before, are more rigid than long skinny ones. So just make sure you have enough length to burn all your powder in your cartridge and then quit. You don't need to add any more length. All right, the next thing I'm going to cover here is probably the most important part of your rifle e equipment selection for long-range shooting, and that is the twist rate of your barrel. All these other things I talked about are really a matter of preference. Your barrel length is pretty important if you want to get uh, the maximum ballistic performance out of your cartridge, but it's crucial that you have a twist rate in your rifle that's appropriate for the bullet you chose. Now, we're talking about long-range applications here. So basically, um, you're going to be using bullets like a lot of your VLD, your very low drag type bullets, or your match bullets are going to be very long, heavy bullets in that caliber. So what you need to uh, realize is that in order to stabilize that bullet by spinning it, you need sometimes a tighter twist rate than what is usually commercially available in, in some hunting rifles. Uh, sometimes hunting rifles are built for 
uh, the medium sized bullets or what you know if you buy a varmint rifle it's going to have a, a slower twist rate usually because it's assuming you're going to be using very light bullets so it doesn't take very much twist to stabilize a short light bullet but if you're using a real heavy long bullet it requires a greater twist rate and that's measured in turns per inches uh, so uh, what you need to do is you need to go look up the literature for the bullet you're using, and that's usually available from the bullet manufacturers or from the ammo companies, or you can do a search online, but you need to find out exactly which twist rate is appropriate for the bullet you've uh, selected. So you want to make sure that you have the right twist rate. Oh, another quick thing on twist rate here too, and I'll talk about this more on our uh, advanced external ballistics, is uh, you don't want to over stabilize your bullet either so don't just get an extra heavy twist rate just to stabilize it more that'll actually have negative effects as well and uh, you'll have accelerated spin drift or it'll decrease your stability at long range so get the twist rate designed for the bullet that you have selected that's very important uh left hand right hand twist Right hand is probably the most common. I wouldn't kill yourself trying to get a hold of a left hand twist. The reason for that is spin drift due to bullet twist. And we'll talk about this more on our advanced external ballistics. Spin drift, which is caused by the spinning bullet, usually spins a, bu a rifle bullet to the right in any barrel with the right hand twist. Now, in the northern hemisphere, your Coriolis effect will always push your bullet to the right as well. Is at any time you have a, a horizontal Coriolis effect on your bullet in the northern hemisphere, it will be to the right. So what you have here is spin drift to the right and Coriolis to the right. Some guys try to offset the Coriolis by getting a left-handed uh, rifle twist because at long range, that can kind of uh, cancel the two out better. Now, you're going to be adjusting for these things anyways. We're going to go through all the steps on how to adjust for spin drift and for Coriolis effect. So... Uh, if you're concerned about finding a left-handed rifle twist, I wouldn't worry about it. All my rifles are right-handed, and I have uh, I just simply adjust for it when I do my firing solution. So don't fret too much over uh, your uh, direction of twist. Right or left, whatever will work fine. We'll be correcting for that very precisely. But your twist rate should match your bullet design. Okay, I want to talk about triggers now. What kind of trigger do you want to use for long range.